Welcome all, we might um, get underway. Good morning to our colleagues from Hong Kong and webinar guests in Asia, and good afternoon to our Australian colleagues and guests. My name is Ian Lyle, Program Leader, Aquaculture, New South Wales DPI. Thank you for joining today's New South Wales Hong Kong Export Connection for Aquaculture Business Webinar. This is an initiative of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and New South Wales DPI. The goal of the next 90 minutes is to provide a platform for businesses to better understand marketing opportunities for our high quality seafood by interacting with three highly regarded industry experts and hear from a New South Wales company, Murray Cod Australia, on their journey to develop export opportunities. Questions have been submitted already and you can send further questions by the chat function on your screen to be answered in a QA session after the key presentations. Should we have too many questions for the panel session, um, we will have contact details for the speakers that will be for, provided. We've got 90 minutes to hear a New South Wales industry overview, Hong Kong market update, and information on consumer trends, market opportunities, and buyer preferences. Most importantly, you'll hear firsthand the tips and insights to help you develop marketing strategies. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to a productive session, hoping that this will be the start of a new relationship between our industries. At the end of the session, we will also have a poll um, with some questions to help us with our webinar series. Thank you. So the first session for today is a background to the New South Wales aquaculture industry. New South Wales is a state of Australia on the eastern seaboard. Um, it is the most populous state and it has the largest seafood marketing area in the country. In New South Wales, we have a very large coastline and 33 estuaries under which we undertake aquaculture or oyster aquaculture. On the inland, we have six major rivers, uh, the longest being the Murray River. As a snapshot of our aquaculture industry, we have both land-based and estuarine businesses. As I mentioned, uh, the majority of our industry is made up of oyster farming in our estuaries, but we also have a developing marine waters aquaculture sector. And this comprises blue mussel farms, and we've also had trials for yellowtail kingfish offshore in New South Wales. Key species that are farmed in New South Wales include the Sydney rock oyster, the freshwater Murray cod, farm tiger prawns, blue mussels, and the freshwater species silver perch, rainbow trout, and freshwater crustacea, the yabby. New South Wales is renowned for high quality, sustainable seafood. And this is backed by world-class food safety programs. Okay. Here's an image of our oyster industry north of Sydney, culturing Pacific oysters alongside Sydney rock oysters. This is an image of our farmed tiger prawn industry on the north coast of New South Wales in semi-tropical conditions. An image of a freshwater fish farm, which can be found across New South Wales, and an image of Murray cod being produced in suspended pens in the south of the state. In this area, the water is used more than once. It's used for the culture of Murray cod and then used for irrigation crops and pastures. We also have the freshwater yabby cultured across New South Wales. Barramundi, or as known in Asia, sea bass, cultured intensively in tanks. Blue mussel production in our embayments. And successful trials for yellowtail kingfish 
in sea pens off the coast of New South Wales. New South Wales has a strengths and capabilities for seafood production. We have a proven base for business. We have a diversity of species and a streamlined regulatory process. We have an international reputation for research and development. And importantly, we have a very innovative industry and well-established industry. These industries are backed by strategies to outline best industry practice and streamline approvals process for land-based, for oyster, and for marine waters aquaculture. And we have the opportunity in New South Wales to invest and collaborate. We have all our sectors across the different marine, estuarine, and land-based areas. We do have high quality, sustainable seafood production. We have extensive seafood processing facilities, hatcheries of freshwater and marine species, and a very strong research and develop capacity. In DPI, we focus on finfish, mollusks, and nutrition in particular. New South Wales is not only the aquaculture industry, of course. We have a large commercial fishing industry with over a thousand fishing businesses with the key export species of rock lobster and black lip abalone. This fishery is quota managed for sustainability. And this slide summarizes their quota species and their volumes for the current financial year. We'd be happy to provide more information on either aquaculture or commercial fishing, and we can be contacted with the information provided later or through our website. Thank you for that um, as an overview and background to our industry in New South Wales. I'd like now to introduce to you Kelvin Horn, who's the Senior Business Development Officer for Hong Kong TV Mall. And he's responsible for recruiting new merchants and assisting their onboarding process under that company structure. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Kelvin. So uh, let me just do the share screen function and then I will showcase my presentation just one second i'm sorry crystal would you mind uh enabling the uh, share screen function for me thank you okay so if you can see my uh, presentation clearly then i shall start now just one second. So um, thanks for having me. Uh, just to want to give you a little background about HKT more first. So uh, we were first founded in 2014 and uh, fast forward to 2019, uh, we have been ranked by a UK uh, brand ranking uh, authority or organization called YouGov as the Hong Kong's top brand in 2019. And then in 2020, in terms of the Google uh, keyword search results, we're actually the second hottest keyword search in the Hong Kong region. So uh, we emphasize ourselves as a landlord, not a retailer that competes with other merchants that are on our e-marketplace. We currently have more than uh, 4,200 merchants or suppliers at the moment, and we carry over 450,000 SKU at the moment. As you can see from the bottom, we have over uh, 13 to 14 product categories. So uh, we would like to use our supermarket product category here at the uh, bottom left corner as a repeat purchase catalyst because our groceries or other daily uh, food products are essentials for a lot of households in Hong Kong. So we use this as a catalyst to make sure that our customers are on our platform to make the purchase on the supermarket first, and then to slowly develop this um, hab shopping habit uh, gradually, and then spread to other product categories accordingly. 
And then um, throughout the years, we have uh, quite a steady and aggressive growth. And in 2020, uh, we have a record high of unique number of customers. And we're looking at uh, 20 to 30% of potential growth in the coming year. So um, here's a pie chart of the uh, product categories and its distribution in terms of the sales. So uh, in the left-hand corner here, we can see that the groceries is uh, over 40% and other product categories that are slowly growing up, such as um, household and uh, houseware, electronics, et cetera. And uh, we noticed that once the customers have developed this shopping habits on uh, our e-marketplace, in general, it's very hard for them to go back to offline um, sales uh, totally because um, it's such a convenient channel for them to uh, make purchases online. So we see that um, regardless of the COVID situation or not, it's likely that this um, shopping habit will likely to uh, carry on in the future. And in terms of the frozen and chilled seafood, uh, we see that there is a, a number of popular countries of origins on our e-marketplace. For example, Norway, Australia, of course, and then Japan, et cetera. And uh, we have over 14, um, sorry, 1,400 SKUs on our e-marketplace that are seafood at the moment. And the average basket size is around 500, uh, 500 Hong Kong dollars. And um, in terms of the uh, products that we see on our e-marketplace, uh, we noticed that uh, frozen abalone might be uh, fairly popular due to the COVID situation right now and people cannot eat outside. So they may have to cook uh, more seafood at home themselves. And we see that the sales for uh, the frozen abalone have substantially stands out at the moment. And uh, just to give you an overview of what HKTU Mall is about in terms of what they are offering to our um, merchants. So uh, first of all, they will have their own unique e-store page, and then we'll offer some operation and logistic support. And then we'll also have some marketing support to our merchants. And in terms of the number, uh, in terms of the unique e-store store page, um, each onboard merchant will get their unique e-store page, and then they will be able to arrange some brand building, such as uploading different cover photos, product image, and descriptions, etc., on their unique storefront. And then, in terms of number of uh, products that they can list, um, is unlimited. In other words, uh, they can upload as many products as they would like. And then our backend uh, system also support uh, their merchants to arrange some promotions. And also the price control is, uh, the price is fully controlled by our merchants. In other words, uh, they can set the retail price as they like on our platform. And then in terms of the CS service, uh, normally our CS team will help our merchants to answer all the questions. And in the case of uh, very specific questions, our CS team will reach out to our merchants first before uh, answering our customers. And in terms of the uh, payment gateway, uh, we do have uh, some broadly used uh, payment systems such as uh, UnionPay, uh, PayPal, PayMe, Visa, Master, et cetera, that are already supported. And once merchants are on board, they can use these to uh, operate their businesses. And then uh, in terms of the number of, uh, in terms of the uh, credit card, uh, transaction fee. The 2-2% two, two credit card transaction fee is already included in the commission that the merchants will split with HKT Mall. So in other words, uh, the merchants do not need to pay an additional 2-3% two, two, credit card transaction fee when they do business. And then uh, the backend systems and the uh, unique store page that we've mentioned, we also offer some workshops and tutorials for our merchants to understand how to operate on a daily basis. And uh, right now, in terms, of, in terms of operations, we are carrying out a workflow called standard delivery. So uh, when merchants receive uh, their sales orders, they will need to arrange pick and pack and then deliver to our warehouse. And then the day after, it will be delivered uh, to our customer's doorstep by our logistics staff. So um, here's a pr practical uh, workflow of how it works on a daily basis. So uh, from Monday to Saturday, um, including the public holidays in between, um, every day 9 a.m. is our uh, cutoff time. So basically our merchants are required to log into the backend system after 9 a.m. and then see how many sales orders that there are that are with transaction time before 9 a.m. Then they will need to arrange the pick and pack and then deliver to our warehouse by uh, 4 p.m. for chilled products and then the same time for uh, frozen products. And we understand that uh, from our merchants address to our Hong Kong uh, 
HATU Mall Warehouse might be a bit difficult for some overseas merchants because they may not have the logistic resource or the uh, facilities in Hong Kong at the moment. So that's why we can offer some fulfill third party fulfillment and warehouse solutions uh, referral to our merchants. So if the um, attendees that are interested can uh, email us later on and then we can show you these referrals later on. And also in terms of marketing, uh, we have some weekly promotions as well as some uh, thematic campaigns that are arranged regularly. So in terms of the weekly promotions, uh, we have this on the left hand side called Flash Sale Tuesday and then on the right hand side called VIP Day. So basically merchants can uh, sign up for free and basically they will need to provide some uh, discounts or proposed promotions. And then once they're selected by our marketing team, they will get to enjoy these uh, additional exposures on our mall so uh, it makes uh, the customers more easily to locate the products and to drive sales furthermore yep. and here's my email address and my whatsapp so in the case of any inquiries furthermore uh, please feel free to reach out to me and this is the end of my part thank you very much thank you kelvin that's brilliant. Yeah, really interesting to see the warehouse solutions and payment options. I think that will appeal to um, producers, exporters in Australia. Thank you for that. I'm pleased to introduce to you now um, two delegates from Murray Cot Australia. And um, we have Lindsay Riley, Group Marketing Manager and Corporate Affairs Manager. Um, she has over 18 years experience in corporate and international communications media, events, investor relations and public relations in Australia and abroad. And we also have Ian Charles, the Group Manager, Hatcheries and Business Development, Murray Cod Australia. Um, Ian has a, a long standing history in our aquaculture industry going back 25 years. Um, so he's really a pioneer of our industry in New South Wales. So um, thank you very much, Murray Cod Australia for joining us. And Lindsay, I think you're presenting first. Oh. I'll just um, share my screen. There we go. Well, welcome everyone. And thanks very much for um, allowing us to join in today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, First of all, I thought I would um, give a little rundown on e exactly, sorry, mucked around with it there, on what is a Murray Cod. Um, for those that, that don't know, a Murray Cod is an iconic native Australian freshwater fish um, dating back, you know, approximately 20 million years. Um, a Murray Cod is only grown in Australia and is one of the rarest freshwater fish in the world. Um, early settlers, um, European settlers used Murray cod as a food source and began a, a commercial fishery in New South Wales um, and Northern Victoria in the 1860s. And commercial fishing of Murray, Murray cod is um, now banned and Acuna has developed a land-based aquaculture model um, to meet the increasing demand for our iconic fish. Yeah. Sorry, it's not letting me, yeah. So a little bit of background about um, Acuna Sustainable Murray Cod. Um, we were established five years ago, uh, a group of um, pioneering um, Riverina farmers got together and established um, Murray Cod Australia. Um, so we're based in mainly in the Riverina in New South Wales, which is um, pretty rare to have an aquaculture industry, you know, more than 550 kilometres from the nearest ocean. Murray Cod Australia is listed on the, uh, the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, and through in-house innovation, we're now producing excep exceptional quality, um, sustainably farmed Murray Cod. So Murray cod is, our Murray cod is grown in open ponds on the murray Darling Basin River system, which is um, the fish's native environment. We believe these conditions make our Murray cod the best tasting on the market. And, you know, we're not alone in that thinking. Um, just last week, we um, were awarded gold at the um, 
Sydney Fine Food Fair for the second year running, which you know we're pretty we're pretty excited about. We've got some pretty um, aggressive expansion plans. So we're currently on track um, to be producing 10,000 tonnes by um, the year 2030. I thought I'd include this slide um, because I think it's really important, um, you know, for all of our markets to really understand um, what we stand for as a business. Um, we've we've um, worked really hard to, to really um, establish something that we think is pretty special and unique, you know, for the aquaculture industry. Um, we believe that the best product becomes from the best approach. Um, and when we want to make an impact on people's plates, obviously, um, but they're wide or lies by inspiring a better way to deliver the future of food production. Um, and then out of that, you know, once, once we established that that was our, our big picture goal, um, you know, we decided that we wanted to, to really understand what our core values were. Um, and, you know, we've come up with quality, innovation, integrity and sustainability, um, which we, you know, as a team, you know, everything we do, um, we, we genuinely refer back to these, these four values, um, which is why, um, you know, our, our business tagline is life tastes better our way. So who's the Queen of Murray Cod for? Well, we um, are quickly starting to realise it's, um, it's a high-end luxury product. Um, it's for customers who love great tasting white flesh fish. Um, with a firm texture and that natural creamy flavour. Um, you know, like our values that, we just, that I just spoke about, we believe that, you know, our sustainable, sustainably farmed Murray Cod is actually more than a product. Um, we feel that it pre represents what's possible when, you know, you combine science-based innovation and practices respectable, respectable to the environment. Um, and you apply those to food production. So Murray Cod is, um, well, our Akuna Sustainable Murray Cod, as I said, is a luxury fish product. Um, it's got a large flake and relatively high fat content that can withstand really tough cooking conditions. That fat content, um, you know, it's it's almost like you know a, a chicken. Murray Cod stores fat um, naturally in the environment, which you know Ian will probably elaborate on. But what we're finding with some of the top um, top chefs around the world, like Heston Blumenthal and Josh Nyland, and they're actually taking that fat now and and rendering it down and using it to produce, um, you know, lots of lots of other things like desserts and um, so. We're finding that you know some of the some of those really high end chefs are really jumping um, on board with Murray Cod because of that that fat fat content um, and utilizing the you know the concept of the the nose to tail eating, um, which is great. Um, the other thing that is really unique about um, Murray Cod is that is its versatility. So it's 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 great as a raw product. Um, in fact, we in export um, slowed down a little bit with COVID, obviously, but we were exporting a lot of um, our Murray Cod straight into Japan, the sashimi and the sushi market. Um, you know, it's also great when it's pan seared, battered, steamed, grilled, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to, to ruin as a product. So I'm going to hand over to Ian now, um, and he's going to, as our in-house sort of farming expert, run you guys through, you know, how we produce um, our Murray Cod, and and why it's um, special and unique. Um, we think the way that we're going about it. Thanks, Lindsay, and um, thanks for the opportunity of of um, giving you a bit of information about our business, our farms, and our fish. Um, I'd just like to start by just discussing, I suppose, where Murray Cod Farming came from and where it's up to, I guess. Um, it commenced in the late 1980s um, on the back of research that was done by New South Wales DPI back in, in the late 60s and 70s. Um, so 
I guess it didn't really develop very quickly from that time on until reasonably recently. I think some of the reasons for that are that um, the right way of farming the fish wasn't really sorted out in the early days. I think that um, a lot of the fish were grown indoors and they were not, they lost a lot of their attractive colour um, in an indoor um, environment. They also didn't probably live up to, you know, the wild fish reputation as far as flesh quality goes um, in that environment as well. And I think development-wise, inconsistency of supply was, was a problem for the industry. Um, if the fish wasn't always available, then people that started selling it lost interest when they couldn't get product, wasn't available to them. Um, so I guess from that, when we came together as a, as a business, we looked at how we could actually grow this fish that it performed well and, and that it was a premium product. So we set about really designing a system that worked primarily for the fish um, so that they perform to their best and that we ended up with a product that, that looked good and tasted good, was healthy and, and was profitable and performed well. Um, we were able, fortunately, to do this designing and, and manufacturing pretty much in-house through our sort of our innovation within our own company, um, which was a big bonus to us. So, so the um, production system is pond-based, the grow-out system, but it's actually it's a system where we keep the fish up off the bottom so we get a better flavour and, and we get the good colour from the fish being grown outside. So we're a vertically integrated company, aquaculture company. So um, we, we cover basically fish production through from egg to sales of finished product. Um, we have two hatcheries. We're the largest producers of Murray cod in Australia, or in the world for that matter, I guess. Um, and so our, our, I'll just briefly touch on hatchery. Um, we have the two hatcheries. We, we produce, I think, this year around, around five and a half to six million fingerlings through, our, through both our hatcheries. Um, and a, a large proportion of those are for restocking programs. So we hold two lines of, of brood stock on our farms. One line is, is um, true to the genetics of the wild rivers in the Murray-Darling Basin. So we breed from those parents to produce fish to restock into the wild. We have government contracts and work with um, fishing clubs through the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in a restocking program there. Um, the, other, the other percentage of our fish, of course, are grown for our own um, grow out systems. So the parentage for those is basically carefully chosen stock that, that um, produce progeny with good confirmation and that perform well in our grow out systems. So the hatchery season commences in late September and runs through until mid November. So it's quite a short breeding season for the Murray cod. Uh, the fish are, are bred without hormones, so they're naturally spawned. After the eggs are laid, the, uh, the eggs are brought back into the hatchery. We care for them there, hatch them, um, look after the larvae for three weeks and, and give them their initial feeds. They then go back out into a pond environment where they remain until, until they're about seven to eight weeks old. They're then brought back in, harvested and brought back in again um, to the hatchery and they're put through a weaning process. So they're, they're trained to um, take and eat a manufactured pellet. From there, the fingerlings will be moved into our nursery system. So the nursery system is an indoor recirculated aquaculture system. The fish stay in this for various periods of time um, until they're anywhere between five and 100 grams when we'll stock them out into our uh, grow out systems. So our grow out farms, um, we have several in, in this area um, around the Riverina. Um, the fish basically move from the nursery into the grow out farms. Once they, once they hit the grow out farms, you know, when they're a robust little fingling, they basically um, 
are fed on the pelleted ration. Um, the pond, it's all pond based with, with suspended cages in the ponds. It's very um, high tech really. We, we've developed really good systems where we constantly monitor water qualities. Um, and we feel that this is probably the key to the flavor in our fish is that we maintain the water quality to a premium. Um, we also have a very sophisticated management system that looks after uh, stocking densities, growth rates, um, and actually programs and dispensers um, feed to each cage individually on a on a needs basis according to temperature and fish growth, etc. Um, probably to the next slide, um, just around sustainability. There's, there's four items you'll see there, water use, energy consumption, waste and wild fish populations. So we do have sustainability goals and targets that we've set for ourselves as a company. And basically with the water use, we use all of our water twice. So um, any water that's exchanged out of, out of the grow out ponds will be utilized to grow crops, um, grain crops or horticulture crops. Um, there's, it's, beneficial in that sense because there's nutrient in the fish effluent water. So that nutrient's taken up by, by crops and it saves on the use of fertile, artificial fertilizers. With our energy consumption, we have a portion of our, um, of our energy is produced on farm by solar. So we produce 50% of the energy that's used through our nursery system by solar power. Um, we also have energy savings through our sophisticated um, monitoring systems in the ponds where um, oxygen levels are monitored and aeration is only used when it's, when it's needed rather than um, switched on and left running just in case. Um, with our waste management, um, as I've described, our effluent water is reused. But as well as that, in our processing facility, we try our hardest to use every single part of the fish and not waste anything. So when we're filleting, we retain the heads, the heads are sold. Um, we use, as Lindsay described, the body cavity fat. We say we've got um, several things on the go with the use of that with different chefs. We also, um, with our fish frames that are left after filleting, we've currently got um, got an uh, operation down the road from us that takes those fish frames and composts them um, and actually farms worms with the compost. So we're using every single, every single bit that we can. Uh, and the wild fish populations, we, as I've described before, we have a large restocking program. So this year we've, we've restocked around three and a half million um, fingerlings back into the wild. It's, um, it's a goal of ours to retain that as we develop our business um, and even expand that, that uh, part of the business to, to do more restocking. Um, we believe that, you know, um, it's one of our responsibilities to be involved in, in uh, maintaining the species in the wild and assisting where we can with that. So I suppose I've probably covered off on most of this slide with our sustainability side of things, but it's, it's a worthy read um, later if you save the presentation. Um, we see a really unique export opportunity for Murray Cod, for our Acuna Murray Cod. I think the several things that, that present this opportunity, I think um, it's well documented that future growth in seafood supply Will need to come from aquaculture rather than wild caught fisheries. Wild caught fisheries um, have plateaued. They've been under pressure for a long time. Uh, a lot of quotas imposed now to try and you know maintain fish stocks to a reasonable level. So it's highly unlikely that there'll be any increase at all worldwide in in um, wild fish in the wild fish market. Um, also, there's an increasing global demand for high quality. Uh, fish protein. Um, we see our product slotting into that category um, very well. It's a, it's a very, very premium product. Uh, it's, it's a rare premium product, as Lindsay had mentioned. 
um, one of the rarest freshwater native fishes in the world. So I think those things, you know, present the opportunity for export. So this slide's pretty self-descriptive. It, it's just um, giving you some information about the fish itself um, and basically the forms that we can sell it in, whole round, head on gutted, skin on fillets. Um, we're in a position at this stage where we can do processing in Australia and do pre-packed you know, fillet portions and that type of thing. Um, so high yielding fish, so it yields, a fillet yield of around 47%, which is really good. Um, we have year round availability, though the breeding season is quite short. The way we farm our fish, we, we have um, year round supply. Uh, a long shelf life of 14 days from the date of packing. And as far as Hong Kong, Hong Kong goes, we, we quick to market um, 48 hours from processing. So Akuna Sustainable Murray Cod's export ready. Um, and we're quite, um, I guess at this stage, we're confident, you know, due to the rollout of the vaccination program worldwide that 2021 will present more opportunities again for our company and, and for the seafood sector in general will give us, give us back some stability that we've, you know, been looking for in the last 12 months. It's not been the easiest 12 months for the sector, no doubt, across the board. And uh, as a company, we're really looking forward to establishing new trade links with, with companies, be it in Hong Kong or, or other locations. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity. I'd like to thank the moderator, Ian Lyle, for, for running the webinar and thanks to the organisers. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Lindsay. I just, if I could just reiterate that to get gold medals at the premium aquaculture competition in Australia, you, you're really seeing the best of the best in terms of this Acuna product, which is, which is really exciting, you know, given the forecast to get to 10,000 tonne of production by 2030. And I think the sustainability story is something that um, people are also looking for. And as you said, Ian and Lindsay, this is a unique Australian product. Thank you for that. I'd like now to introduce Eugene Hu, from Jiangsu Hong Kong Business Hub. Uh, Eugene attained his business degree at Boston College, Massachusetts, USA. And his family has over 50 years of trading experience in food and beverage products. This um, makes his family and Mr. Ho well placed to help overseas brands enter the Southern China region, including but not limited to Hong Kong and Macau. Thank you very much, Eugene. Hi, uh, Ian, thank you. I, there seem to be some problem with my camera. So I think I'll just, you know, share my voice and my deck. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Can hear you fine. All right, I'll share, I'll, I'll just push the uh, share screen button now. That's top. Is that it? Can you view my can you view my deck? Yes. You can view my deck right now. Yep. Is that good? Is that good? That's good. Okay. All right. Hi everyone. Thanks for having us here. Now, um, our company's uh, name is a bit awkward. It's Jiangsu, which is a province in mainland China, Hong Kong Business Hub, because our company has been doing. Um, uh, in the food business for a long time. And we trade, we actually trade salt from Australia back to Hong Kong and China. And the salt is from the Jiangsu province, which is famous for cities like Nanjing and uh, Suzhou. And uh, Jiangsu salt has been the main salt which Chinese eat for 2,600 years. I'm, I'm telling you guys this because our company's profile is actually in the back of the deck. That's, that's why uh, uh, I'm gonna say this out loud first. We are the main business of our company is not seafood. We have affiliate companies, we do it, but because we have been in the industry so long and we uh, trade salt, we know you know a thing or two about the Hong Kong food industry. That's why we like to share some of the you know uh, facts of Hong Kong. And then we have some, 
I saw some questions that some of the you know participants sent over to the host, and we'll try to answer that to our you know best uh, um, capability. Uh, thank you, TDC and the uh, NSW Department of Primary Industries for having us today. Now, I think for uh, some of the uh, participants who are already exporters, you know a thing or two about the Hong Kong uh, overall picture, but let us just give you some brief stats. You know, Hong Kong started out as a fishing port, so we are intelligent seafood consumers. We know fish. We, input, uh, we import over 90% of the food we eat, and we are, you know, crazy seafood connoisseur. Look at the figures. We are number two in Asia. The seafood we eat is double that of the mainland Chinese. There's no import tax on seafood or frozen seafood. And um, before the COVID, there are already 25,000 restaurants, you know, buying seafood. Uh, seafood has always been our, the main component of our diet because you know, the Chinese diet and Hong Kong people love Japanese food, which is, you know, uh, life, fresh and frozen seafood. But in recent years, I would say the last three years, the trend in online shopping and the insurgence of new retail shops is really staggering. It's, it's really surprising. In terms of online shopping, the only major player is the speaker we had, Kelvin, Hong Kong TV Mall. There are no alternatives. They are the Amazon and people are just so used to buying from them. But of course, from the you know, retail shop, the traditional channel is actually still very large. That's you know, our role because we distribute our products through online and offline. So we're gonna share a little bit about the traditional offline channels. Uh, why are there so many new retail shops which sell frozen food, especially meat and seafood? It's because before the COVID, maybe some of the you know Australian friends heard of it. We have the social unrest protest, and that drove a lot of shop rent down at least forty percent. So in Hong Kong, a lot of shops are vacant. But then a lot of uh, meat shops, seafood shops, food shops took over these vacant spots at a much lower rent. So actually, Hong Kong people are quite lucky now because we can eat a lot of good food at relatively lower prices. And we can always go to Hong Kong TV Mall to order you know, a, a, a reasonable priced products. So I think that is a big opportunity for Australian exporters. So um, in terms of the origin of the imported food, you know, in terms of the preference or no, uh, the, the, the popularity. So of course, it's always made in China, they're closest to us, but even Japan and Australia, there's all, you know, the, um, the amount of seafood imported by air freight is actually still very strong because Hong Kong people love fresh seafood. Indonesia, Canada, for the frozen, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a misspelling right there. Food, Japan, especially shrimp, shrimp from Vietnam, and of course, France. There's a lot of high-end restaurants still in Hong Kong. They have survived, you know, COVID, they're still going strong. People are actually buying high-end takeout from France and Western restaurants. So this is, an example of the new shops opened up in the last two, three years. On the, from the left hand side, up, upper corner, there are new mega stores, 6,000 square feet. You know, they just sell imported food, Koreans, you know, specialized new shops. Um, in, in the bottom, you can, you know, tell that we have, you know, have good stuff at good prices. We have Danish organic chicken for only, you know, $13. And on the right, it's a really large Japan Discount King, which has a large department in the food industry, uh, in, in the food in the department. They're actually a discount mega store. 
which sell Japanese food or things that are made in China, but you know, packaged like from Japan. One of the sh only one shop, a new shop in Hong Kong sold a few million dollars worth of uh, it's, it's Hong Kong dollars tuna sushi in like two months in one shop only. And they're, this brand is going to open up 18 new mega stores. So, you know, Hong Kong people eat seafood like crazy. Um, one of the participants asked about the, how the industry works in Hong Kong. This is a very brief uh, slide, which is actually shared by a listed company in Hong Kong. And it's uh, one of their annual reports. Actually, the Hong Kong uh, market is simple if, if, if uh, presented on a slide. But actually, if you go into the industry, it's very complex. So it's hard to explain here. Basically, you know, exporters are here, and then you have the importers. But, you know, the roles are very, very blurred right now. On the right, there are resellers, wholesalers who used to, you know, resell to restaurants and et cetera. But, you know, they are all mixed up the roles right now. Even especially in the real health sector. Um, for example, uh, Hong Kong TV Mall is actually, it's also in the logistics business. They handle the logistics for, from the exporters. So who knows that, you know, they will actually import the food by themselves very soon. In Hong Kong, there are two large supermarket chains. One is by the end of the AS Watson group. The other it's, um, called the Welcome Group by the billionaire Li ka -shing. They actually, they have more and more of the OEM brand food, especially seafood. They actually directly talk to the exporters right now. So this trend, I think the exporters have to be beware. If the you know, participants of this today's seminar want to have our PPT, we're more than welcome to share it uh, via the uh, Department of Primary Industries or the TDC. And some of the examples of the major players, for example, the importers, we listed them here. But if uh, we, we encourage some of the uh, Australian uh, exporters to try to approach them, but we don't know if they will respond because they're too big. And the largest retailers, uh, HATV Mall, AS Watson Group, which is the park and shop supermarket, welcome. And a very local but large uh, group is called DCH. They actually provide wholesale all the ingredients to all the fast food chains in Hong Kong except McDonald's. So one of the participants asked for the import price reference. Um, I'm going to share a bit of our you know two cents here. This, actually, this is actually published uh, data by the Hong Kong government, so it's not too updated. The shrimp went from 201 to, you know, $64 Hong Kong dollars to uh, dropped a little bit in recent years due to price competition because the shrimp from the Vietnam is really cheap. And the USA, somehow they're eating less shrimp. Uh, 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 uh. We don't know why. And probably because of the shrimp diseases happened um, a few years ago. But Hong Kong people just, you know, they love shrimp, fresh or frozen. Cuttlefish, squid, and octopus, it actually went up a little bit. And this, it, it's a very, it has a very direct correlation with the import price from China. Fishes, that's the, you know, important part, it actually went up. Main breeds, we consume our, you know, belayed whole fish. For example, salmon, flounders, tuna, herring, sardines. And I, I think, you know, our speaker will like it. Codfish, we love codfish. But the one thing we, I would like to communicate to the um, Department of uh, Primary Industries is that various governments in, uh, have been promoting heavily in Hong Kong. The Japan government, has been investing a lot in advertisements in Hong Kong, promoting fish and sushi. We see them, their advertisements every year for several years. Norway has been promoting like crazy. They have been spending a lot of money in terms of advertising, you know, to consume salmon. So I think 
maybe you know the Australian government can help out the exporters a bit. Maybe not only you know putting in advertising dollars, but just have more you know uh, uh, um, you know stand-ins in seminars, conventions in Hong Kong. That you know that helps the exporters. You know that's a really strong endorsement. So in terms of not only seafood but in general, the food-related spending trends in Hong Kong and Macau are these, you know, according to several um, newspaper and magazine sources. Number one, substitute meat is quite popular in Hong Kong now, not only Beyond Meat or Impossible Meat, which are in fast food chains now in restaurants. We eat it, I eat it. Non-diary products, they are quite um, popular now. Number two, like we said, the low rent has spurred so many new import uh, 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 themed retailers, especially frozen uh, meat and frozen seafood. Um, that's an opportunity for uh, exporters, but the a small problem is that they are too, they are really scattered. Number three is you know wellness uh, oriented uh, food. It absolutely has you know is it much higher demand now low sugar, you know, high fiber, et cetera, you know, ready to eat. Online shopping, I don't want to repeat that, I already said that. Number five, have related food. Maybe seafood that, you know, boosts immunity. So I'm, you know, this is almost the end of my presentation. This is from one of the uh, participants asking TDC and the, um, and the, you guys, the question about oysters. I'm going to make it very brief. I'm not going to read every word here. Hong Kong people actually they like Australian uh, oysters, but it's actually you know not in the top three. The, the top three is actually French, Scottish, Irish, New Zealand oysters. But we love Australian oysters, especially the heavy flavored ones. Hong Kong people like heavy flavored food. We have the, a thousand year egg, a thousand year tofu. We love sea urchin, so please bear in mind, we love the juicy, tasty kind of food. Even codfish, we eat codfish because it's, it's very fat, but we eat codfish in the summer because it's so heavy flavored. So uh, Cobbin Bay, in terms of pricing, you can, uh, you can see right now is around that range. It's not high at all because Hong Kong people are very sophisticated eaters. So these are the retail prices of, from some of the restaurants and websites. As I said, um, we can share this deck later on. Barramundi, um, Barramundi, it's, it's popular, but uh, it's actually not considered high end in the Chinese cuisine world. So we are not sure about if it's worth it for you know, air freight to import Barramundi because there's a lot of Barramundi from mainland China. So we're not, we asked about, we asked the industry people, we're not sure about that. Be, people love high-end seafood from Australia. And that's always good, going to be good demand, like abalone, lobster, even I'm looking into importing lobster from Australia and codfish, but Barramundi, we're not sure. So the industry as a whole, how to find partners? We think the top choice is the B2B sourcing website with HKTDC. You go there first because people can look up your contact, and you know they. You know, there are a lot of successful cases. Um, in terms of the pricing, please ask TDC directly. It's affordable, and uh, HKTV Mall can do a lot, and I know. They are looking forward to import a lot of Australian seafood. If not, Kevin wouldn't be here today. And we are actually a close partner with Hong Kong TV Mall. Hong Kong TV Mall is like, you know, Hilton Hotel. We are like a tour agency. We do the hand holding. We do all the logistics, all the paper filing, the government stuff. So you can go to go to them directly or just go to us. It's the same. We also distribute your stuff uh, via the traditional channels. In the past, seafood is not our 
major business, but we are looking into uh, importing middle to high end seafood if the terms are good. So please drop us an email. And actually, uh, uh, yeah, and I'll provide our WhatsApp to HATDC as well. Um, one participant asked, is it better to go with partner JV or just an agent? Um, we asked, you know, we asked some industry people, we think that it's better to be married than just have a one night, one night stand, you know, don't mind my, you know, casual, you know, uh, 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 wording. Because Hong Kong is such a mature market for seafood, we think it's better if you have a partner that, you know, really grows with you. There are so many agents around. If you have really short-term, shallow um, relationships to test it out first, it's fine. But we think you should look for long-term partners, JV. We think that it's not only that you give good prices, you need to know what else you can support in other than prices. Um, one one uh, participant asked, is minimum quantity required? Is it costly for refrigerated freight? Is price important? The minimum quantity is between you and your importer. So we cannot say, but of course, it's better to fill at least half a container. For example, a 20, a 20 foot container. Otherwise it's not, it's not worth it. Um, refrigerated freight, it's around double that of, of um, non-refrigerated freight. So we'll say around 2000 USD for a second, uh, sorry, sorry, for half of a, like a 20 foot container refrigerated. That's a very, very rough figure. But the real cost is actually the warehouse in Hong Kong. And as you know, Hong Kong has one of the most one of the highest rent in the world in terms of residential, commercial, and even warehouse. And including the people working in the warehouse for you. So that is the main factor that you guys should be beware. That's quite expensive. Land is scarce in Hong Kong. So you, it's better you guys to look for someone who already has refrigerated warehouse and the logistics for refrigerated freight. What are the terms of payment in Hong Kong? You need to be aware because for seafood is actually, you know, 20, 30% down payment. I think the advantage is on the buy side, not on the sell side in Hong Kong. Expect full payment close to six months. Maybe you have signed with them, you know, three months, but most of them, you know, they will not honor it. It's the hard truth is the reality. So you need to be ready about this. So it's almost the last screen here. If import regulations and the law, it's actually quite flexible to export to Hong Kong in terms of government re uh, regulations. You know, uh, this is the link. Please go to the link. The government is very helpful. The, you know, you can even call by long, uh, by, you know, long distance 1813 for digits, that's the government hotline. They will answer your questions. They are fluent in English. That's a plan pamphlet, but I don't know why they just published the Chinese version only, but actually that's more ge geared towards fishermen. The, the long story short, you should have the, all the testing done first. Heavy metals, malachite green, because you know we did have some incidents if you a few years back, especially with lobsters, shrimps from import, you know, sources, growth hormones, Hong Kong people hate that, you know, AOZ. The government will have random testing and actually they test a lot. So actually my deck is done to, uh, today. Uh, I'll just go over very quickly. We are a two agency. We actually work with I know Australian and foreign companies in terms of food, but seafood has not been our main business. We are getting into that and we hook, us, we hook people up. So this is our background. I'm not going to uh, waste your time here.
we actually import salt from the Western Australia. I think it's, you know, Usus Loop Shark Bay. So that's it. This is the uh, email. Um, I'm going to share my share our WhatsApp uh, uh, number with uh, TDC. And thank you very much today. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Eugene. That was um, really comprehensive. We've um, yeah, we certainly learned a lot from you this afternoon. The the volume of consumption of seafood consumption in Hong Kong, the new retailers coming through, the online shopping focus. Um, the preference for heavily flavored seafood, such as oysters and cod, your recommendation that our governments need to do more to promote the presence of Australian seafood in Hong Kong, uh, establishing long-term partnerships. And, and finally, the quality of seafood coming into Hong Kong. And um, as we speak, we are undergoing residue testing within Australia for our products, our wild harvest and aquaculture products so that consumers importers can be assured of the quality of the product. So thank you so much for that. That was great. We now move into a session to um, answer your questions. As I said, we've had a number of questions come through to us already, which we will answer. Um, you have an opportunity and we do have some time to answer additional questions. If you go to your chat um, function on the screen, you can lodge additional questions. Our first question here, question one, is about the impact of that pandemic. And I'm wondering if we can get Bonnie to answer this question. Thanks, Ian. Uh, indeed, the pandemic has caused major damage to the global economy. And according to uh, Professor Paul Romer, uh, the 2018 Nobel Laureate for Economic Science, um, his forecast is that um, Asian economy will recover faster than the other regions and that um, uh, Asia will lead the GDP growth in the coming years. Now, there are already positive signs that with increased business activities in some of the Asian markets. Um, as to Hong Kong, um, our forecast is Hong Kong's export will grow by 5% uh, this year. As to the uh, fish consumption, uh, well, fish consumption is predicted to increase by 21% to 178 million tons uh, by 2025. And again, Asia will account for the strongest growth estimated around 73%. And as uh, Eugene earlier in his slide, he has already pointed out that Hong Kong um, is one of, has one of the largest seafood consumption in Asia. The per capita is uh, three times that of the global average. So, uh, and Hong Kong relies heavily on imports. So all in all, I think post COVID, uh, the uh, Asia, uh, Asian markets present good opportunities for Australian exporters and Hong Kong will continue to uh, be a strong market um, and continue to remain as a uh, major trading hub uh, in Asia. Thank you, Ronnie. We'll move to question two. How to find potential customs or distributors and certification required. Might throw this to you, Eugene. I think you've already addressed some of it, but you may want to elaborate a little. Okay. Um, this is uh, quite hard to answer actually, because it's like, how do you find a wife? Uh, but it is possible through the help of, as I said, through the help of TDC. I think you should, really register for the sourcing.htdc.com first. Have your record be transparent to any potential dis, um, Im, importer. And uh, I don't want to be an advertisement, but Hong Kong TV Mall is actually very convenient for exporters who do not know what to do because they control most of the uh, online business 
they can refer to refrigerated partners. It's actually quite one stop. And as for ourselves, we don't mind, uh, you know, as a friendly gesture, helping out some of the um, partners to try to find partners. But the big distributors already, for example, one of the examples I gave you, Worldwide Seafood, they already have 300 kinds of seafood and they're listed. All, the, all those are big ones. The middle ones, I'm not in the road to, you know, recommend them. So uh, I think the first step is go to sourcing.htdc.com. I think Bonnie has a discount for a dozen companies joining, signing up together. And for the certification requirement, actually Hong Kong government is pretty flexible, but the only thing is you need to have a lot of health uh, certification from your country of origin, which is you know the ones you got. Hong Kong people love the ISO certification, so it's uh, it's just common common you know uh, common sense. Have all the required safety certifications ready before you come into Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government will test your products very soon. They will come into your registered warehouse to look for any um, problems. But actually the whole process is the import partner should do all it for, should do all that for you. So it's not, but, but like I said on the, my deck, the testing of the chemicals is very, very important because that's another independent body in Hong Kong called the Consumer Council. They do testing and publish all the news to all people in, you know, for the public to see. And they always test for chemicals in food and seafood. So you need to be very you know, thorough in your own you know, procedure for you know, reading of any chemicals. That's my answer. Very good. Thank you, Yu Ying. We'll move on to question three. This is definitely um, Kelvin's area, this one. Hi. Um, so uh, drawing from the data from uh, February compared from uh, 2020 to 2021, we see uh, two types of uh, frozen seafood particular stand out. So the first one will be the prawns and then the second one will be scallop. So prawns have uh, more than 9% of uh, increment in terms of sales uh, compared to the uh, same month last year. And then scallop has a record of 13% uh, increment uh, compared to last year. Great. Thank you for that. And question four, what is a major hurdle or pain point in exporting seafood that exporters need to be aware of? And I think we may um, go to Murray Cod Australia for that one. Yeah, I guess um, for us, um, looking into the export market in Hong Kong, that Eugene's given us um, some good information there is, is on um, export regulations. Um, you know, where we go with that compared to other countries. And I guess um, also referring back to the last 12 months has been um, certainly pain point for anyone wanting to get into any new export market um, due to COVID. Um, certainly with, with fresh product, the domestic flight, uh, the international flights rather, have been very limited and, and air freight prices have been through the roof over this period of time. So that's been a very big, very big issue for any of us that have been looking at establishing new market. Thanks, Ian. And I think Eugene has a comment here too. Yeah. Um, I think the price point, it's actually a hurdle because Hong Kong people all the Hong Kong people are very aware of all the prices. So for example, Australian lobster, which I'm, I'm actually interested in, um, in, in importing. Right now, because you know, China you know, is, is having difficulties on importing lobsters from Australia and other countries. In Hong Kong, you can get Australian lobster at Australian dollars, $33. That's one tenth of what we bought maybe 10 years back, one ten. 
So I think the exporters have to be aware that, you know, you can have business, but, but, but you know, the Hong Kong consumers are just as intelligent as the uh, importers. And, you know, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. The next question, I think Eugene has addressed a number of these areas, but we might throw back to Eugene to see if he wants to add anything. Oh, um, the key players, uh, yes, I already listed out, I listed out the top few key players, um, which, you know, the participants can get from the deck. The sales processes, uh, that's not, that's nothing complex. You, you just need to have a lengthy, uh, uh, um, negotiation process with them. And of course, we need samples first. They always need samples. So I, I don't, you know, that's not, no, not much detail I can add to that because people, Hong Kong people like to negotiate and talk. There's no formal step-by-step. -step. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Eugene. Moving on to question six. On the industry level, what is the latest development for, seafood, for the seafood industry in Hong Kong? And we might um, throw to Bonnie for that one. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, the industry, I mean, um, there is a push for sustainability and traceability for seafood imports uh, into Hong Kong. Uh, being a free port, Hong Kong imports uh, seafood from over 160 countries from around the world. And as Eugene uh, has pointed out previously, uh, a few years back, there have been some food safety incidents, um, not only in Hong Kong, but in Macau, uh, China, and some other Asian uh, markets. So uh, consumers are concerned of uh, food safety, um, and it has driven the uh, buyers to source from uh, regulated and reliable uh, supplies. Um, so the traceability in the uh, uh, seafood production, uh, the handling um, is of growing uh, importance and the government is also looking at imposing regulations. Um, I believe that it's actually uh, um, to the benefits of Australian exporters like Akuna uh, Murray Court, which I mean, you are already uh, focusing on the sustainability and traceability, um, and it will. Um, it is a trend that is likely to uh, to continue. Thank you. The next question we have: Are Hong Kong consumers familiar with Australian seafood, and how do they regard it compared to other seafood products? Um, knowing Ian Charles' extensive travels over there. Did, did you want to answer this one, Ian? Yeah, uh, um, in reference, I suppose, to Murray Cod in particular, um, I think we, we really don't have the experience in Hong Kong as such as yet, but our experience in Australia, um, where we do have, you know, quite a large Chinese and uh, Chinese population and particularly, um, you know, many people out of southern China and Hong Kong, who moved over here over the decades. Um, the Murray Cod's really very well accepted by them and by the Asian population in general in Australia. So we presume on the back of that, that, that you know, that will transfer to um, consumer um, acceptance in Hong Kong. Yeah, good. good. Thank you. What are the two B two C channels to reach Hong Kong consumers, and are there any supply chain support around it? We might go to Kelvin for this one. Sure. So, uh, in terms of the B two C channels uh, for Hong Kong consumers, so HTML will obviously be uh, one of the major one, and then also there are other uh, e marketplaces in Hong Kong that uh, certainly uh, the potential merchants can have a look at in Hong Kong. And also uh, in terms of the supply chain support, uh, in terms of HTML, we do offer some uh, fulfillment and consignment referrals as mentioned in my slides earlier. And other than that, uh, we can also offer some support on filing some application form or some local licenses uh, that the government requires for listing online on e-channels. 
And then uh, in terms of the labeling or the nutri uh, nutrition uh, requirements, then we can also offer some um, support or knowledge on that for uh, merchants that are interested to enter the Hong Kong market. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'll just double check, we don't have any other questions that have come in that can be put up. I'll just check that, but what we do, um, I'd like to introduce Bonnie Shape, Director of Hong Kong Trade Development Council. Um, Bonnie helped us with the Q&A and we probably should have introduced her before, but Bonnie leads a team to assist small and medium-sized enterprises in doing business in Hong Kong, China, and further enhance the good trading relationships between Hong Kong and the Australasian region. Having grown up in Hong Kong and living in Australia and traveling back and forth to New Zealand for the last 29 years, Bonnie has a really good understanding of the business dynamics among the three economies. Thank you, Bonnie, for your update and closing remarks. Thank you, Ian. Um, let me share my screen and I... Now in... Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. In the next few minutes, I'll briefly introduce our organization, HKTDC, and talk about how we can help um, you to tap into the Asian market opportunities. HKTDC is a um, statutory body that has been established for almost 55 years. So my office in Sydney uh, has been helping Australian uh, businesses to connect with um, agent, distributor, importers, suppliers, um, and even investors uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we are a global organization with 50 offices uh, around the world, including 13 in mainland China. A range of services is offered uh, from the traditional product magazines to um, the uh, uh, lately, the online marketplace, uh, but we are best known for our international trade fairs and events. Um, some of those are the largest of its kind um, in the world. Last year, because of uh, COVID, many of our events have to be rescheduled or cancelled, and we swiftly shifted online, uh, organizing virtual exhibitions, online conferences, and the results have been very encouraging. I'll show you um, the two major uh, virtual exhibitions last year uh, that we had. Um, the second one, which is the Autumn Sourcing Week online um, in November last year, um, we doubled the number of buyers to over 27,000 buyers. And um, between the two virtual exhibitions, a total of 14,000 one-on-one -on -one business matchings uh, uh, were conducted and the business deals were, uh, were done. So we're very glad with the, uh, with the uh, results and we are now in full preparation for the international sourcing show, which will be launched on the 17th of this month, only a couple of weeks away and covering um, all these industries that are shown on the slide. Now, last year, we have also revamped our online marketplace. It's a B2B platform. Um, Eugene has mentioned earlier, the hkdc.com sourcing. It is backed by our very extensive database uh, with over 130,000 quality suppliers and over 2 million registered buyers. Now, these buyers uh, usually come to our international trade fairs. Um, and they are global buyers. Um, the breakdown, as you can see here on the slide, not only from Hong Kong, China, 28% uh, of them are from Asia, 14% uh, from Europe and 13% from North America. So it is a platform, a great platform for Australian exporters, um, especially a first time exporters to extend, uh, ex expand their sales network and be connected to global buyers. Um, we also uh, applied AI and machine learning technology when we revamped our um, online marketplace 
to make it easy for the buyers to source the products and the suppliers to um, set up their online uh, store. Now we are, I'm glad to say that we are a trusted uh, marketplace. Uh, we work with government um, trade promotion agencies to establish country pavilions um, so that it gives um, confidence for the buyers when they source on our marketplace. Um, we are looking at establishing an Australian food pavilion on the marketplace uh, to connect Australian exporters with global buyers and help them to get ready for the economic uh, recovery. The package is very uh, good value. Um, the basic package starts from 440 US dollars per company. Now I won't have time to go through the details, but if you're interested, please contact my office and we will see how we can best assist. We are also planning for physical events um, in the, for the second half of the year. The Food Expo um, is scheduled from the 12th to the 16th of August. It's always a food extravaganza. Um, as you can see in the slide here, um, New South Wales have previously participated at the Food Expo um, and the New South Wales Pavilion uh, attracted a lot of international buyers. Before I conclude, I want to take the opportunity to um, extend our sincere thanks to um, New South Wales uh, DPI. Uh, thanks Ian and Helen for your help in organizing this webinar and special thanks to all the speakers to take time out of your busy, busy schedule to share your insights. Um, and of course, to all the participants, um, I hope that um, now, I mean, with we all working together, uh, we can help you to look at the export opportunities um, and expand and help you to uh, grow your business. With that, I um, pass it back to Ian. Thanks, Bonnie. That's great. We just had a couple more questions come in. And one of them is, and it's good for you, Bonnie, is Hong Kong a good launch pad for importing throughout the ASEAN? It is indeed. Um, uh, Hong Kong, is, as, as a trading hub, has been doing um, uh, business with all the ASEAN um, uh, uh, countries. And in fact, uh, we have signed um, free trade agreement with the ASEAN economies. Um, and we have the growth the, um, between Hong Kong and the, um, uh, and, um, the other, I mean, ASEAN economy has been growing as well. The, the, th the good, I mean, strength of Hong Kong is, I mean, on the logistics side, it's very efficient. Um, not only, I mean, from Hong Kong into um, uh, mainland China, but also into other, other um, uh, Asian uh, uh, countries. And the thing is, historically, there are also a lot of um, pe people to people um, connections. Uh, many um, Asians of uh, businesses um, uh, have set up their operation in Hong Kong as well. So, and over the years, uh, the business connections are very well established. Excellent. Thank you. And Kelvin, perhaps we could ask one more of you, please. Are there peak seasons in the Hong Kong market for specific pro products, for example, Chinese New Year? Mm. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, the people, the population in general have seafood throughout the seasons, but uh, in particular in summer or festive times like Chinese New Year, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the demand will likely to go up. So for example, uh, there is a way of having uh, meals called hot pot in Hong Kong, which is uh, dropping uh, fresh seafood right into the uh, pot and then with different uh, different uh, soup or different uh, kind of uh, ingredients in it. And then uh, in that particular uh, type of food, that seafood will be very uh, popular among the hot, food, uh, hot pot way of having food. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I think we might um, have come to the end of our session now. Um, had a chance to answer a few questions. I know there are still a few questions out there and we'll provide those contact details. And I think uh, for the benefit of, of DPI and um, Hong Kong um, Development Group, we would like to throw up the poll for people to add their comments to. That'd be very helpful. 
Um, we would like to thank you all for your time and energy in attending the webinar today. We, we hope it's been useful to you. And um, we look forward to presenting more information. We hope that um, you will form these linkages between our countries and um, you will have great success with your seafood exports. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and please um, take time to complete the poll. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Um, and we really appreciate your input into the polls. Thank you to all our speakers for taking the time to provide their expertise um, and to the organizers of the event. Thank you very much, and we will catch up with you soon.